Hi everyone, welcome. I'm going to talk a bit louder today. So, welcome to whoop, June for MELB JVM. Uh, hope everyone's had a good month. Let's get straight into it. Ooh. So, as usual, we'd like to say our thanks to everyone for coming, um, as well as Aconex for the venue, food, beverages. Can you hear me up back? Okay, I'll try a little louder, so yeah. Um, our usual supporters, Docmosis for the awesome name tags, as well as Hayes for recruiting and stuff. And we have our usual uh, IntelliJ JetBrains prize draw for tonight, so just a reminder, stick around to the end, we'll have a raffle draw, and um, if you've got IntelliJ already, you can choose something else, uh, JetBrains. So, hopping on to the news. September 21st, 2017, Java 9 release date. So this is a bit of a question mark. So how many of us have been following the whole Jigsaw uh, EC vote? So earlier this month, um, Jigsaw was rejected by the, the Java Executive Committee. Executive Committee. Um, it was a 10 to 13 vote, um, rejecting it because of some issues with how it's been set up. Um, so. They were thinking about pushing the Java 9 release date to September 21st for that, um, so delaying it by eight weeks. It hasn't been officially announced just yet, but they're trying to talk about it either tonight or tomorrow, depending on the US time when they make the announcement. But um, they have com commis commiserated around it and had a bit of a chat about it. They've got a resolution for it. They're going to release Java 9 with Jigsaw disabled, but apparently it will have a flag to enable Jigsaw. So. Sorry. Yeah. To be, to be clear, it's they, there's this thing about accessing modules, <coughs> which has been a contentious thing that was required to compromise, and the, the compromise has been, well, we'll launch Java, and there'll be a flag, and by default, <coughs> Jigsaw module access is going to be very permissive, so you can access every module with yep. <coughs> specifying anything, and then there's flags to enable warnings <coughs> and flags to disable it completely. And then in the next version of Java, they'll actually change it to be the opposite and be denied. So you've got another whole Java version, or well, another five years to, <laughs> to get your code working on modules. Um, but that's the currently running stance. And uh, yeah, that looks like it would get through. So. Yeah. So in other news, um, Sun, Misc, Unsafe is actually going to be safe in Java 9 for now. Who knows what they'll do in Java 10 around it. but. There was basically a lot of talk, especially for quite a lot of libraries that use it, and um, moving away from it would have broken the the availability of some really cool features on the JVM. So they've kept it in. The credit goes to Hazelcast. Yay! <laughs> for keeping on set there. Yep. Um, the next thing is Project Amber. So this is around Java 10. So this is mainly type inference, um, data classes. So if anyone's played around with Kotlin, you might be familiar with it. Um, and pattern matching. So there's a bunch of JSRs around that. And it's got some really cool features. So you'll be able to have local, local variable type inference. So no string foo equals this. It's now just var or val like Kotlin. It's very similar. Um, another interesting bit of news is that James Goslin at James Gosling, uh, founder of Java, actually joined um, Amazon. So that's quite an interesting new venture. They haven't really talked about what he'll be doing uh, officially just yet, I think. But um, it's quite cool. And in terms of conferences, there was WWDC last night, just kicked off. And especially Google I.O. this year. So has anyone been following some of the Google I.O. stuff, especially the mobile developers around? No? Um, so one of the big things is um, Kotlin is officially supported um, with uh, Android development. So if anyone is interested in it, just give us a shout later on, and we might do something in the future and have a talk about Kotlin. So it's actually another JVM language. It compiles down to Java bytecode, JVM bytecode, excuse me, and you can actually use it interoperably with normal Java classes and so on. Yeah. So. Moving on, next meetup, we've got July 5th. Um, keep your eyes open on meetup for announcements on the content. It's coming up soon, and we'll announce it very shortly. And as usual, if you'd like to connect with Melb JVM, we've got a bunch of links. So we've got our Slack, we've got the blog, YouTube. So if you want to watch the videos from tonight later on or any of our previous videos, hop onto our Melb JVM YouTube and you can check it out. 
And tonight, um, so I'm just going to do a very brief intro. This is Rahul. He's one of the developer evangelists from Hazelcast. Yep. And he'll be talking about um, riding the jet stream. So I'll let you get on. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. One sec. Goes here. Yep. That should do it. It's not that it's facing me, it should be alright. Yeah. Come on. You tiny little twat. Okay. Thank you. I'm slightly jet lagged. Can you hear me fine back there? Yep, cool. That's my friend there. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Let me get into presentation mode. I'm Rahul Gupta, I work for Hazakas as Senior Solutions Architect. Uh, and without, uh, and that's my Twitter handle there at Wildness. If you're interested, you know, getting to know more about Hazakas, what we are doing, you know, along with just tagging onto Hazakas tag, you can, you know, feel free to follow me on that one. So why we are here today? I'm going to talk about a brand new product that we released a couple of months ago. It's called Jet, right? Before we move forward, who here has heard of Hazelcast before? Ah, nice. Cool. So you guys have used Hazelcast or just heard vaguely? Cool, perfect. Who here has tried their hands on Hazelcast Jet? No one. OK, that's easy. OK, uh, right, so Jet. Begin with, that's a. That's the name we came up with, and why? The reason that we needed something, a product that could work fast. Now, that's a very, very random statement, right? Very vague statement. The, the bottom, the, the foundation of JET is that we know that there is, you know, there's a problem of big data. The problem is that how do we deal with it? There's a lot of data coming in from different sources at different you know, uh, in different amounts and how to deal with the data, how to process the data. And we also know the problem that if we don't act on the data in time, we lose the value, right? So in today's world, the problem has shifted from big data to faster data or faster processing. So what is JET? JET is basically a distributed computing or distributed data processing engine, right? Which is based on directed acyclic graphs for data modeling. And we will we'll, we'll look into what is direct exactly graphs are and uh, how they are different, how JET is different from our competitive uh, you know, solutions. JET basically facilitates moving big data processing into real-time processing. What that means, we have a bunch of data lying with us coming in in batches and so on. But to react fast to the data, we are talking now talking about streaming of the data, stream processing instead of batch processing. And JET facilitates that. Just to give you a high-level uh, uh, overview of JET, it distributes Java Util streams. I'm, uh, who all are here familiar with Java Util streams? All of us, cool. So Hazelcast JET distributes Java Util streams, right? So those who have used Hazelcast and who have used Hazelcast data structures like IMAP, IQs, and others, it's something similar. So I, we have a data structure called iStream map, which is, again, an extension of Java Util stream map. JET also extends computational services, uh, computational uh, capabilities from Hazelcast that we had in Hazelcast IMDG, things like iExecutor service, entry processors, MapReduce, and so on. Did anyone have a question? No? <laughs> And JET is built on top of Hazelcast. So Hazelcast, what that means, so JET uses the underlying infrastructure of Hazelcast, so which provides, which takes care of high availability, consistency, and all those kind of things. We'll look into that in more detail. So we still don't know of JET, right? What is JET? 
before I get into the you know nuts and bolts of Jet, let's take a look at. Uh, I want to talk about the vision where Jet fits in. You know, high level, what kind of use case it it facilitates, it serves. So Jet means a Hazelcast Jet cluster, right? Which means a bunch of nodes running together and doing some stuff. Hazelcast Jet cluster is able to ingest data from different types of sources. So you can have different sources, different sinks. Hazelcast Jet can you know, ingest data from you know, streams, from IoT systems where sensors are producing data in real time every second. Jet is able to consume data from social networks, Twitter feeds, Facebook, you name it, it's there. Jet is also able to consume data from Hazelcast data structures. And then it does some processing. You know, what does it do? We'll look into that in more detail uh, very shortly. But then as an output, Jet is also able to connect with you know, different types of, uh, where are these? Oh, why are we, why is this guy not here? OK. Uh, for, for sources, we have all those kind of sources. And we, for sync also, Hazelcast Jet is able to make connections with things like HDFS, again, Hazelcast IMDG to use them as syncs. And as a result of data processing, it is able to produce results meant for you know, creating alerts, things like enterprise applications, and so on. This slide here, it talks about Hazelcast architecture of Jet. So spending a few minutes on this, so starting from the bottom, this layer here, it describes the infrastructure on which Hazelcast Jet can run. So it can be deployed on any operating system, be it uh, Linux, Unix, Windows, and so on. Hazelcast Jet are processes are Java processes. So we support OpenJDK, Oracle, you know, IBM, Azure, and, and so on. And then Hazelcast Jet can also form a cluster using different types of topologies, things like you know, creating a cluster with TCP IP, creating, running a cluster on multicast uh, UDP, or Apache J Clouds, AWS, console, ETCD, Eureka. You can deploy Hazelcast Jet cluster on Cloud Foundry. Uh, and there are different types of other uh, uh, discoveries, well, other, type, other infrastructure that you can use to deploy Hazelcast Jet. Going on, uh, moving further, these guys here are, is, is basically your gateway to Hazelcast Jet. These are the APIs that you're going to use, that you use to interact with Hazelcast Jet cluster and to, to extract the capabilities of what Hazelcast Jet provides. Currently, Jet supports Java applications. So if you have a Java application, you can use uh, Hazelcast Jet. We are in the process of providing support and building support for other uh, platforms also, things like C, C++, C Sharp, you know, uh, .NET, and so on. So is Hazelcast Jet any special? Uh, I'd say yes. It's not because I work for Hazelcast, uh, but there are other reasons also. Uh, it works great with Hazelcast IMDG. And what's the benefit? The benefit is Hazelcast IMDG is a tried and tested product. It's been there, been deployed in you know, tons of mission critical applications and for ages. Jet is very, very easy to program. Since it extends you know, standard Java libraries, the APIs are very similar to what you see in standard Java uh, SDKs. It's simple to deploy. It, is, it uses lower stack of Hazelcast. It is built on top of Hazelcast. So it's deploying a Jet cluster is as easy as writing one single line of code and starting it in, main, you know, in your main program. It works in pretty much every cloud. If you have a cloud solution where you do not find support for Hazelcast Jet, let us know. We are very keen on making Hazelcast IMDG and Jet available on pretty much all the cloud solutions. It's high performance. It's highly performant. We will see how different it is compared to other competitive solutions. And it's, it's for developers. It's made by developers. It's for developers. It's open source. You can fork the libraries. You can fork the GitHub. If you have a cool feature in mind that you think that should be part of Hazelcast Jet, please feel free to you know, uh, talk to us. And you know you can commit to our, you can contribute to our code base. 
different types of uh, deployment strategies for uh, Jet cluster. So similar to Hazelcast, Jet can be deployed in two ways. One in embedded and one is client server. Embedded is, is the easiest way of deploying Hazelcast Jet, where the Jet instance runs inside the same application space, uh, inside the application space, which means the same JVM. So you have an application JVM, and you initialize a Jet instance. That makes the application instance uh, a, Jet cluster, it's a Jet cluster member itself. <clears throat> It is great for creating microservices architecture. The other one is client server, where you have Jet instances running in their own dedicated environment, and your applications interact with Jet servers using Jet client APIs. Exactly the same way as you would do with Hazelcast IMDG. How Jet works with the Hazelcast? So you can have a Jet cluster running in tandem with Hazelcast nodes. So you have Jet and you have Hazelcast instances running together, and they can and Jet can use Hazelcast instances as sources, as source and as sync. So Hazelcast instances or Hazelcast data structures can supply data to Jet, can feed data to Jet, and then they're able to consume the result of a Jet process. Embedded and in uh, client server mode. So what essentially is JET? Right now, time to get you know uh, look deeper into JET. What JET is a DAG processing engine. Who all are familiar with DAG? Very few. Okay. So whatever I'm gonna say, it may not make sense. I may be talking rubbish. I may get away with it. Uh, okay. Now, so DAG. DAG is directed acyclic graphs, right? It's, it's nothing to do with Hazelcast. This is the concept of this simple distributed systems concept, right? Well, everybody struggles with DAG. But DAG in general, if you understand it, it's easy, right? DAG consists of this paradigm where you have vertices and edges. So what is vertices? In DAG engine, you, in DAG model, you have different computational entities. What you see here in circles A, B, C, D, E, F, these are computational entities, and, each, and they are called vertexes. This is vertex, this is vertex, that is vertex. You can connect many vertexes with each other. You can configure one vertex as input and other vertexes as output. The connection, is hap connection happens through edges. These arrows, these are called edges. So you can create a vertex uh, process you can create multiple vertices, and you can configure which vertex is going to be the input for the other vertex, and which vertex is going to be the output for the other vertex. <coughs> there are other systems available in the market which use uh, DAG implementation, things like Apache Tez, Flink, and Spark. And as a matter of fact, the existing uh, MapReduce implementations like uh, Cloudera, they are moving away from MapReduce. They are now adopting DAG. Let's take a look at an example, right? So we have enough of talk. Let's say if we lived in a single threaded world, right? A simple example, word count, where we have a text file, and in that file we have lots of text, and we want to calculate how many times a particular word has appeared in that file, right? Simple word count example. So in a single threaded application, we would do a sequential process, things like we iterate through all the lines, we split the line into word, and we calculate each time a word has appeared. That's how a single threaded uh, word count implementation would look in, in Java, right? So we can represent the computation, this computation here, the word count implementation, through DAG. So we have an input, the input is our text file, we supply the input, this is a tokenizer, this is a vertex, right? In tokenizer, I just split the line and tokenize the line and convert it and create words out of it. This is my another uh, uh, vertex, which is reducer, right? Which is basically essentially calculating how many times a word has appeared. And then this is my output. Again, this is uh, another vertex process. Now, this is all single threaded. We can actually parallelize 
the execution of vertexes by introducing queues, concurrent queues. So I have, I can put queues here. Why would I want to put queues? Because I can have multiple threads which could read from the queues at the same time, right? Now, what I've done, I have divided, I've introduced multiple tokenizers which are reading from the queue, and there are two tokenizers in the system now. And because, why I do that? Because now I have multiple threads. Earlier, this was all single threaded application. The moment I introduce multiple threads, since I have queues in place, I can have one thread doing one tokenizer, and the other thread is doing another tokenizing job. And then they're both sending their output to my vertex reducer here. I can get to another level, where I can make reducer also multi-threaded. Right, so I have two tokenizers and two reducers. Again, these are my vertexes. Each vertex is, is receiving data from something, somebody, uh, from some entity, doing some calculation, and sending its output to other vertex. Anybody has any questions? Am I going too fast? I got a question. Sure. Um, so what, what is the difference between uh, this model and having token current thread that access, access the same resource? So for example, like you got a, like let's, let's talk about uh, web, web application. Mm -hmm. The two requests accessing the same value or the same data in the database. So what you say is that, um, so if we had like a queue of information, several threads could process the same information independently? Is that what you say? I'm sorry, I lost you so in the last line. I'm trying to find, understand the difference between this model and a multi-threaded model. Okay, this is multi-threaded model, okay. right? Now these guys, these are individual threads, okay? This is one single JVM, right? Mind you, this is not, these are not multiple JVM. This is one single JVM. Here, this is one JVM, one thread. First is doing tokenizing job, then doing reducing job, and then dumping out the output. Again, same JVM, I have multiple threads, two threads. One of them is, two threads are doing tokenizing job, and there is one thread that is doing reducing job. Okay. Another, again, same JVM, now multiple threads doing everything. Tokenizing, reducing, and all those things, right? Input and the output uh, vertexes, uh, they respons then become responsible for splitting out the input? Was that jets? You are splitting out here. Yeah. Input is your source, output is your sync. So, how does the, see how there's two lines? Obviously, uh -huh. one, one line's going to one thread, one line's going to another thread. So, who's responsible? Is that a, a jet responsibility? Or is that so, you define which line you want to send to which vertex, right? You define that the output of this guy will go here and here. You define that, okay. right? So th th these are called edges. These lines that you connections that you see, these are called edges, okay. right? So you define the edge, the input and output, both ends of the edge, you define that, okay. right? We'll see that in, in, in an example. Now this is multi-JVMs, right? This is the clustered mode. Here, this is one JVM, one JET instance, this is my another JET instance, right? This is where we introduce parallelism, right? And this is where partitioning of Hazelcast comes into place, where you store the data temporarily in a partition so that it can be retrieved by a JET instance, which is doing its corresponding vertex, which is basically processing its corresponding vertex job. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, how's the previous slide, sorry. Um, so it's kind of uh, in the reducer, um, if the same word is the word count, right? So uh, if one line, say two lines have the same word, you need, you need to uh, count that, right? So how do you send um, that word to, uh, based on the key? So is the tokenizer, does the tokenizer know that you need to send this word to this reducer so that the count is increased? So is that you, what you define in the jet or? Tokenizer does not know how many times a word have, has appeared already. 
tokenizer's job is just to split the line into words and send it to reducer. Now it's reducer's job to keep track of how many times a word has already appeared, but then, uh, even if it is in the same line. That's right. But um, a line which is gone to tokenizer one will not go to tokenizer two, right? So who will do the combiner? Once you get uh, account in the reducer, you have to have a combiner. You can do that. We'll, we'll get there. We are getting there. We can, you can do that. That's the next slide here, right? So you can have a tokenizer, you can, which is a mapper, basically. You can have a reducer. You can have a combiner. So these are not Hazelcast APIs. This is just a model. You can build this model using Jet APIs, right? Tokenizer is the name of my vertex. Reducer is the name of my vertex, and so is combiner. Okay, you can build the whole thing using Jet API. These are the token either user and combiner. We don't have those kind of things. Well, we do have, but not in DAG. We'll see that. Yeah. Partitioning. Distribute partitioning. That's where partitioning comes into play. If you, the moment you introduce combiner or moment where you introduce uh, distributed computing, that's where partition comes into place. Uh, just uh, from your diagram, it seems like when, whenever you call um, the calling mechanism, the start and the end is basically should reside in the same node, shouldn't basically get distributed. So It can be distributed. So your source can be distributed. Your source can be local to the JVM. It could be anything. You can define that. So you basically have to tell the JET cluster that here is my source and here is my sync. Now, your source could be uh, a centralized database, right? Or it could be a local data store to that node, to the JET instance. OK. Any questions? No further questions? All right. So what's the deal? Right? We, all these kind of stuff is, is also available with competitive solutions like Spark and Flink and Tez. Right? How is Jet different? So we did a benchmark. Simple word count use case. And this is the performance. Uh, and these, these benchmarking is done in public, uh, on, on public benchmarking frameworks like Radagon and so on. So it's all the available on public domain to, for you to see. On a word count use case, this guy is MapReduce, the blue strip, right? Smaller the better. This is basically the latency graph. Yeah, latency graph. Jet is already twice as fast as Spark. It is 40 times faster than MapReduce. So we did not bother including MapReduce in our further benchmarking. So. Now this, this graph here, it shows different level of benchmarking. So the blue strips here is 64 GB and the red strips are 642 GB, right? So see this, the way Spark and Flink behave perform with both set of data. Spark and Flink perform similarly at around the same benchmarking with both set of kind of data set. But Hazelcast performance increases with the volume of, with the increase in volume of data. Uh, Jet is already faster, is also faster than uh, Java's fork join. You know, uh, we've done this with single noded and multiple noded uh, cluster. And it turns out that Jet is faster than JDK's JUS implementation. All right, about time to get, to dig deeper into the code base, to, into the internals of JET, right? The APIs and, and the core of it. So JET provides low latency and high throughput distributed DAG execution, right? We have seen that. Every vertex is, is you know, every vertex has processes. Processes has tasklets. I'll, I'll, I'll skip that part, it might get boring. So in every vertex, you have processors. So what processors is basically the framework where you implement your computing 
algorithm, right? This is where you implement your, this is the main workhorse of JET, JET application. There are some predefined processors, things, take, take a look at an example here. Uh, Traverse array, that's my process. Processor. Group and accumulate, again my processor. There are a bunch of processors already available, we have written in our APIs that are already available for you to use. Uh, but you can also write your own processors. Processors are nothing but just a simple implementation of an interface called processor. Abstract processor, maybe. It takes some inputs, and it, can, it does the calculation. I'll show you an example very soon. And it emits the output. Uh, let's take a look. No, I skipped that part. Here. So that's my producer vertex, and that's my consumer vertex. It's a producer-consumer example. Each vertex has number of tasklets. What are tasklets? Delimited or split, that's my tasklet, right? Count is my tasklet. Uh, where is? Get value, no. Where is this? Mm. That's my processor. Initial zero. This whole thing here is my task click. Right? So you have multiple tasklets that comprises of a vertex. So a vertex has multiple processes. Sorry, a vertex has multiple uh, vertex has processor, and the processor contains multiple processing logic, which are called tasklets. We already seen that vertexes can have more than one input and uh, output. Data input and output. Uh, so Hazelcast Jet can connect with the Hazelcast IMDG data structures like IMAP, iList, and so on. It can also connect with HDFS, Kafka, Socket, file streaming, and etc. Okay. Let's take a look at some of the APIs. Right, what are the APIs that, that, is, uh, that makes the whole Hazelcast Jet possible? Starting with processor, since it's the most important part of uh, you know, using Hazelcast Jet system, there are a bunch of methods that you need to implement. One is uh, and try process, which is basically which is where you write your own processing logic. The next one is complete, and I think that's about it. This is your DAG API. It may look complex, it may look difficult, but let's take a look at this, what it's all about. So this is my DAG API. Uh, I initialize a DAG here, and this is how I create and initialize my vertexes. This is a very, this is a long process, does a lot of job, but let's uh, here. Uh, where is it? DAG.new vertex. That's how I create a vertex. What is my vertex? This is where I write my vertex processing logic, read map. Another vertex is here, let's say dag.new vertex, doc lines new. So this is how you create new vertices. Once I've created vertices, I connect them using my edge APIs. Now these are my edges. Remember that connections between vertexes? Mm. This is how I connect my vertices. I do a dag.edge between source and doc lines, right? Doc uh, dag.edge and so on. So you create vertices within the same APIs, using the JET APIs, and you connect them using edge or edges. Yeah? Is it right to visualize the graph um, through the, like through an image, like through the Hazelcast mm. UI or something? Yes, so we have a, a management center-like utility uh, on our roadmap. It will be out soon, not just yet. About distributed Java Util Stream API, again, we support all JUS uh, 
stream operations such as map, flat map, filter, and so on. You create a JET instance like this, like a Hazelcast instance, JET.new instance. And similar to Hazelcast data structures, you get a reference to uh, a streaming map here. And you perform your normal streaming operations on the stream map. Got a uh, distributed collections collector. I think that, that's a Hazelcast specific collector. It is. So this API here, again, uh, is Hazelcast API, right? Since a distributed operation, we have made Java stream distributed. So we all these collector reducers are, you know, gotta be distributed collectors and distributed operations. Currently, the processor API is quite low level. Right, since it's low level, it's very powerful. Uh, there is a bunch of documentation already available uh, in, on, on our website. Feel free to take a look. We are in the process of building some abstraction on our DAG APIs so that you know, it is easier, relatively easier for developers to use to make use of JET. Uh, okay. Okay, now does this thing actually work, right? Let's take a look at an example. What I'm gonna show here is a simple word count use case. I'll just quickly convert into a presentation mode. Oh, sorry. Come on. So this is my word count use case, right? What it's doing, I have a bunch of source files here, text files here. Uh, JetBrains, slow. There you go. So these are my source, you know, these are my, this is my source or the text files that I'm going to produce for word count use case. So I've got, all these source files here, which I'm going to process using Hazelcast JET as word count. So I'm gonna count every time a word has appeared in all of those files, okay? Let's take a look at the code itself. There you go. Now this particular example, I use Java, distributed Java Idle streams using Hazelcast JET, okay? Here, I initialize a JET instance. So at this line, at this stage here, this line will create a Hazelcast JET server node. I create another one. So I've got two node cluster here already. Now here, I get hold of a map. A, this is a simple Java, sorry, simple Hazelcast map. And in that map, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna read the files line by line and feed those lines into my, into my distributed map, right? And then I'm gonna read the lines from the received map one by one, tokenize them, and do a word count processing. That's the essence of word count processing. And all of the, that is done, or can be done, using my simple Java Util stream map, right? But the advantage here is, this lines, this is my iStream map, this guy here, right? So this lines, this map is my st distributed streaming map, all right? So with just one line of code change, forget this, forget this, if you only change the initialization of your iStream map to a simple Java standard map, it would become a standalone Java map, or st a standalone Java, uh, Java to stream map, right? So after that, again, this map is my Java Util stream map because it is, you know, Hazelcast maps extend Java standard APIs. And that's it. So this is, this, is, this is line of code that you write to make a distributed Java Util stream map API a functionality. So let's take a look and let's run this.
Ooh, error. That's not good. Socket request. Why do you want? Okay. I promise, I swear it worked fine half an hour ago. <laughs> All right, let's see. Okay, that's why. Oh, nope. Can't assign request. Why? Why not? Where is my Wi Fi? Again. Why? What is eating my Wi Fi? Where is my Wi-Fi? Wow. Oh, man. This normally works. No, it, it works. Come on, no. Why, what is wrong with you? Uh, this is slowly becoming embarrassing. Okay, what went wrong? You just worked. For what it's worth, Rahul was sitting here just before the talk and running through everything. Uh, okay, why, 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 why? Config, jet config, da 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 da. Let's take a look, turn this thing off. Ah. Uh. Nope. What? So the ports seem occupied. Why the ports are occupied? No idea. Kill all. <laughs> yeah, uh, but should not be. I don't know why. What, who is eating my port? Come on, man. Okay. Let's close these guys one by one. Okay, you go first. Yeah, but um, you know, it should not be. No, I'm just switching everything off. Like this. Hmm. There you go. Come on, man. Nope. Yeah. If you can reconnect to Wi Fi. Sorry? If you can reconnect to the Wi Fi, you'll have to. You won't just have a loopback address and then like start working again. Anyways, it picked up our default uh, configuration. So. <sighs> Alright. So what it did, it populated the map with these many lines here, right? It's the same, same word count use case. And it just executed and calculated the number of times the world has appeared in all of those files here. And these are not made up numbers. These are the real data. I promise, I swear. So that's how, how easy it is to, to, to use or to convert a standalone Java util stream map into a distributed Java stream map, or this video stream map. Okay. All right. The next bit. Now, the word count might be just too, you know, uh, uh, too small a use case for, for most. So let's take a look at another use case. Now, this is, I'm sure, I, I just tried this before started, I started speaking here, so it should work. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is, I'm gonna show a real, another real life use case where I'm gonna start a Hazelcast server node, right? 
and Hezekiah server, I can attach some, I can make Hezekiah server node dump out some diagnostic logs, right? Things like real time CPU usage, memory usage, heap usage, pending operations, cluster operations, and so on, a bunch of heaps of data that Hezekiah server can dump. So I'm gonna analyze, I'm gonna capture those logs in real time, analyze them, and react to it. So what I'm, to be, to be specific, I'm gonna latch on to the memory statistics, heap statistics, right, the garbage collector problems. So I'm gonna see how is my memory usage going on. If I'm close to 70%, then it's an alert. If I'm close to 80%, it's a serious alert. 90%, oh, you're gonna crash. Right, so I'm gonna raise alerts. Just to give you an overview of how or what kind of logs Hazelcast uh, server can, come on. You worked. What is this? Come on. Okay, let's do it other way down. Ah. So what I'm gonna do is Kill this, start a Hezekiah server. Yeah, that works. I'm gonna open this uh, text wrangler. Let's see if that works. Come on. Okay. Go big, go big. Oh, come on. Come on, man. Why is it not reload from this? Yes. Can everyone see this at the back? See what is written there? No, it's not clear? The logs? Yeah. No, for you, I know, but you're sitting in the front, man. Come on. People at the back, can you see this clearly? Yeah, all right, okay, that's, that's, that's saving grace, okay. So this is the kind of information Hazelcast member dumps out, right, as a result of diagnostic log. So I have a Hazelcast server running here, this guy here, and it's dumping out these logs every five seconds, okay? Here, take a look, this is printing, physical memory available, my operation memory available, JV memory available, operation, all those kind of Hazelcast related logs, GC counts, and so on. So what I'm gonna do, I'm going to create a DAG process which is going to read onto these file, this file, it streams a file back into my DAG cluster, uh, my JET cluster, and my JET cluster, I have written a, com uh, a processor, it's not a predefined processor, I've written a new processor, a custom processor, which basically reads this, all of these logs every time it comes to the system, processes it, and processing in what is basically filtering out all of these logs and reading what is relevant to it, and then emitting the results. Let's take a look at the code first. All right, I call my project Jetoscope. It's a stethoscope. Okay, so this is how I build a DAG here. Let's go into presentation mode. Small example, I create a DAG instance here. I create a vertex. Now this vertex is basically streaming, is basically listening to my folder, directory folder here. Users Rahul Jetoscope 1. This is the directory that vertex is listening to. Every time a file comes into this directory, that vertex is gonna latch onto that file and start reading line by line, right? That's a, that's a Hazelcast made processor for you already. It's called stream file processor. Okay, that's one vertex. Uh, what is this? What is this? <clears throat> okay, I don't need that. You go back. Why do I see exceptions everywhere? Hazelcast sample. No, I don't need you. Not now. Exit presentation mode, yes. This is what I need, yep. Okay. I create a vertex here, file stream. 
the stream files is a preprocessor. It's a processor by Hazelcast. You just need to provide the directory name, and it will start reading the file and the content of it line by line. Then I create another process vertex. It's called transform. Here, I have a transformation logic written in my processor. It's called Jetoscope line P. Let's take a look at what is inside that processor. That's my processor. So I extend, it extends the abstract processor here. And this is where I, what I implement. I implement this try process zero method. And there would be, yep, that's it. And here, I just read the line. I read the line and filter out everything, whether it's runtime.free memory, max memory, and so on. Right? And then I put all of this, this, these statistics together in a map and emit it out as an entry result. So here, this line here, after processing the lines, I put in my map, and I emit that this is a processor API, emit, which is basically to return whatever you have processed. Right? You want to return this, the, the, the output back to your vertex. This is where it gets returned to the vertex, and then pff, the general stuff. And then the next vertex I create is print, where whatever I have collected so far, I want to print it out. Now in print, I can, I can create a vertex here that says raise alert. Right here, it's my, simply I'm doing print, which means I'm just printing the alerts and whatever it is happening. And then as the next step, I connect these vertexes. So I have this file stream vertex. The output of file stream vertex should be the input of my transform vertex here. So I connect these two vertexes by edge, one edge. And the next edge defines the output of transform going into my print vertex. Make sense? Yeah? And then that's it. I, I return my DAG. Now let's, let's run this now and see how it looks. If it is able to run without embarrassing me any further. So we got a file here, we got a Hezekiah server running up here, cool. Start, let's start the, no, oh, I don't want you. Oh. Where is the guy? Ah. Okay, let's run this. Oh, actually, before that, let's kill this. Uh, stop this guy here. Kill everything that is running so that you don't feel that I'm cheating. Uh, delete this file. Oh. I'm going to start my JET node, my JET instance. So as you see, as my JET instance starting up, it's a one node cluster. It's a one node instance here right now, and it, it dumps out the logs at what are the vertexes we have created and what are the edges that we have created. So as you see here, it is watching this directory that I've defined there. So anything that goes into the directory starts reading the the content of the file that goes into the directory line by line. So right now there's nothing in my directory here. So I'm gonna start a Hezekiah server process. And I've got my log files coming here. Now what is my JET instance doing? There you go. So currently, it's just reading the memory statistics from my logs. And the logs are being printed by Hezekiah server every five seconds. Right? Now, Let's, let's see what happens. So currently, my, my Hezekiah server is doing nothing but just sitting idle, because there's nothing happening in the server. There's no data coming to Hezekiah server yet. Let's start a, a client instance, which will just send some data into my Hezekiah map. Right? So I will latch on to my Hezekiah server here, and I get a Hezekiah map here. And I'll just do a map.put, infinite. Yep. I've got some eviction policies in place, but that's not important. Uh, let's run this. 
So here now my client is sending data to my Hezekiah servers, which means the statistics of my servers are going to change. Right? The memory utilization is going to change because now server is receiving data from my client. There is data going into the server. So as you see, let's do a tail on There you go. In my, and why is it coming, like why, why, how come my JET instance is creating these, 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 these uh, messages here? Because this is where I have written my logic of printing results or reacting to the particular statistics. So if I have my memory percentage going below 15, that's a serious memory alert. Below 20, ignore me, and so on, right? So I am able to fetch um, the, the, the statistics, I'm um, fetch the desired data that I wanted from my files. Now this, this, these files are streaming real time into my JET cluster, right? All those logs are coming into my JET cluster real time, constantly. And my JET cluster, my application, is now able to react to the data coming into it and produce the desired result. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any questions so far? Yep. Uh, although it's a dad, but what if you unintention unintentionally if you create a graph, a cyclic graph, does it does it show any compile time error? Sorry? When you create a cyclic graph, mm -hmm. where in the what is a cyclic, in the edges you connect is like going back and forth. Does it have a compile time check? Mm -hmm. Or it's acceptable? It is. So you can, it will give you trouble if you run into a cyclic loop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? But that will happen on the, at the runtime. For compiler, it doesn't, the compiler doesn't know the state of your connections. We kind of give the edges and the, the link things, right, with the edge object. Edge accepts vertices. Yeah. Edge does not know which vertex is input, which vertex is output. It defines the, the connections. Right, so you can create two edges, which are basically just keep it connecting two vertices in the loop. The compiler won't know, compiler won't complain. It's your jet cluster which may run into a cyclic loop infinite. Is that something that in the future you would want to have a runtime warning for? Sorry? In the future, would you like to have a runtime warning? So develop, you know, you've got multiple developers, they don't understand the pipeline properly. They, they accidentally create a cyclic loop. There's something you can do with so there are, there, we still have the concept of timeouts. Okay. So if if a job that you submit it doesn't get completed in a stipulated time frame, then it times out. You can do that, uh, or you know, if you expect a job to finish in five minutes but it doesn't, it just keeps going on and on and on. Then you know there is a problem. <laughs> All right, uh, any questions? Sure, no questions. All right, okay. So if let's say in my lab, if uh, my room is fixed on trash, uh -huh. does it resume from wherever it left? I mean, it does maintain the state. Okay. And you do maintain the state with the... Uh, this is the question I was hoping yeah. nobody would ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the answer is, in current situation, in current... Uh, uh, state, you have to resubmit the job, but we are building fault tolerance for uh, for JET. Fault tolerance uh, already existed in Hezekiah's IMDG uh, libraries, like executive search and all, but we are building fault tolerance for JET API also. It should be out in 0.4, which is three months' time. So with fault tolerance in place, you won't have to resubmit anything. We will have checkpoints in place. Well, obviously, it's not gonna be the same. Uh, yeah. But uh, we'll, so we're gonna be. It's gonna be based on uh, checkpoints, right? And then pff, there are a bunch of stuff. 
But yeah, we will have fault tolerance for JET uh, pretty soon. It's on our radar. Yeah. Also, does it maintain the state for nodes? Like, uh, if we are working on cloud, if we are working across different nodes, say, people nodes, mm -hmm. and one of them is down. Like to show one of my processor is connected to different processor on say a different node. Does anything maintain the state of that node like it's say it's down? That's what fault tolerance is all about. Fault tolerance will have the 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 house will do all the housekeeping work related to failures, node failures, crashes, and also on. Even when you add a, a jet node in the cluster, that will also be taken care of. That if I have a cluster of four nodes going up to five nodes or six nodes, then what to do with the existing running nodes or uh, running jobs? So all that will be taken care of uh, in point four. So um, all these vortex, uh, let's say like the processors, so they can be um, existing in a single JVM, mm -hmm. communicate amongst each other, and or or as well in different clusters, and that's where the performance comes. Can they can communicate across different? Mm, yes, in a cluster of different nodes. Yes, multiple nodes. That's where the parallelism is. Correct. Uh, and that's where maintaining the state is challenging at uh, this time. Sorry? That's where maintaining the state is challenging. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's more of a challenge is because that we, we had other priorities okay. to introduce JET. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, maintaining state, guaranteeing that uh, all the failures are, are handled uh, you know, b the best way possible is already there with us. Uh, we have already had uh, those kind of features in our other APIs, okay. which are not JET, non JET APIs. It's just that uh, we have not had the priority to do that in, in, in existing releases. But we, it's had been, it has been on our roadmap. It'll be available soon. Okay. Actually, let's yeah. talking about roadmap. Let's take a look at the roadmap. So point three one. We have had uh, distributed computation and all those things here. Fault detection is already there, ability to detect failures. So we propagate the exceptions and events if a, if a, if a failure happens or if a fault happens in the cluster. But in, and in that case, a user has to resubmit the job. But once we have uh, fault tolerance in place, then you won't have to resubmit the job from yourself. Right, Heather Cass will take, Jet will take care of executing your job from where it was left off by another cluster, by another node in the cluster. Uh, we have uh, back pressure, which is like throttling the the server nodes and the client nodes from sending more jobs, or basically it's uh, throttling vertexes in this case. So if I have one vertex sending lots of output to other vertex as input, then the other the input vertex can throttle. The, this vertex here, that okay, slow down. I, have, I, have, I am yet to catch up. So all those kind of things are already there in, in, in Heathercast Jet. We have streaming readers, we have socket streaming, we got file streaming, example of file streaming we just saw. We got connector of Kafka, you can attach a Kafka stream to Heathercast Jet as source as well as, as a stream, uh, sync. And we got connector both for HDFS. Uh, with streaming APIs, uh, this is so. These are some of the features uh, in in the upcoming releases. Uh, robust windowing support. So in our distributed streams, we have uh, the concept of windowing. Uh, so we're gonna have the support for more windows. Uh, uh, and apart from that, we got uh, high performance integrations coming up with streaming map and cache events, projection and predicate. Anyone knows here about predicate projections? Now, the concept of predicate and projection is, in, it comes from Hezekiah's IMDG. So we have, if you store a bunch of data in IMDG cache, you can query the data by writing predicates, right? But you can also write projections, which essentially means if you have an object, let's say you have an object, say employee, and that has 
you know, smaller objects inside. So an employee has, uh, it may have an object field called address, right? So if you wanted to query only the data inside that address field, you can write projections. So you will be able to work and write computation algorithms on computation logics for JET instance at the granular level of that object. So you have an employee, you have an address, you will be able to write a computation logic which will deal with the fields or the values of your address field. That kind of work. And there are more connectors coming up, JMS, JDBC. We are already on Cloud Foundry. We have released our public tile uh, for Hedekast. So we released a Hedekast tile for Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So we are on Cloud Foundry. We are going to be open, on OpenShift very soon. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, back pressure and integration with streaming APIs. Does it, is there any integration with stuff like ArxJava or the Reactive Streams project? Uh, that's also, uh, uh, yes, it, it's not just yet. But as I said, Jet is the, this is the new product, right? So there are a lot of things that we still need to introduce. We are, there's a lot of things we, you know, we are yet to catch up on. So Reactive Rx Java is, again, one of those that will be soon available. Um, you showed us how to use like, syntax and how to use the API and all that. But what happens when you start to go down? How does it split uh, the job to make it faster? Does, does it understand what the CPU is? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, it splits it in, in the cores. Uh, how, how, um, so each vertex is, uh, you know, uh, so c taking the concept of uh, concurrency from Hazekas IMDG into Hazekas JET. So this is basically the fundamentals of Hazekas. We define the concurrency based on the number of cores you have made available for a JET instance or a Hazekas server instance you run on, right? With, with the JET APIs, with the JET infrastructure, we tend to create a lot of CPU core affinity to a process, right? So we know that which process is going to be running on which um, you know, on which node, and then you know, you know, my cores are tied, latch, latch onto particular thread. So we maintain, we try to uh, achieve as much as core affinity as possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm sorry, another, another one. Um, also, you show the streams used as a single stream. Mm -hmm. um, is, is it silly to ask if you can use parallel streams or? or because I thought we were gonna see something of the fork join or that happens inside of, of, of JET? So when we saw multiple threads, right, within the same JVM, that was parallel uh, streams, right? For example, you gave it was a single, it wasn't a parallel stream, it was just one. Ah, so see, stream is what? Stream is the source, yeah. right? So for a JET instance, the example that we saw where my JET instance, JET, JET cluster was reading data from my log files. Again, that was where I was streaming the content of my log file into my JET application, right? So stream is your source. And how you process that stream, you can define the parallelism of your processing, right? So stream could be your source, a Kafka stream can be your source, a Kafka stream can also be your sync. So you can read from Kafka stream and write, back on, write your output back to your Kafka stream, things like that. You can read from a file input stream and write onto a Hezekas IMDG map or an HDFS system. So basically, you don't, unlike Java write streams, you don't you get the parallelism automatically. You don't have to you don't actually have to say dot parallel stream or dot you know, dot parallel. You, that's part of the You have to define you have to define the API to make it parallel. Okay. Otherwise it will be single thread stream in within that JVM, within that JET instance. If you want to make it distributed, if you want to make it parallel, you do have to define that, that, okay, that stream to be parallel. Any further questions? How, how does uh, Jet guarantee that it's not going to process the same source message twice? So if you're splitting a file, how does it know that all the, you know, half the file lines are going in one vertex? So it basically puts the marker 
Uh, I don't know the details of uh, you know uh, how a stream processor works or stream file processor works, but uh, vaguely remembering, uh, I think it puts the marker in, in you know it, it, latch, it latches on the file, it reads the file, and from where it stops, where the content is no more there, it puts a marker, and the next time it picks up from that place. So but that's vaguely I remember. A little bit like, um, say, things like the Apache Camel Weaver, but if you're mentioning the inbox and the app, the messages, and yeah, like everything that's a for messaging. Yeah. But Camel deals with messaging primarily, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's an EIP. Yeah. yeah. You had a question here? Uh, no, okay. This, I've got a question maybe for myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, so maybe I need to review the, the multi-threading part of Java. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find what is the main difference between parallelism and, and multi-threading. Would you be able to, to give some light on that? Otherwise, I'll, I'll go back home and then look at it. Yeah. So I, I don't understand your concern. So basically, we, we're talking about parallelism and how quicker it is than using multi-threading or batching. So my understanding is that parallelism is, so we're using several um, vortex, for example, or processes, to be able to access uh, concurrently or work concurrently on different uh, data sources. Um, in uh, multi-threading, so it looks like that um, several threads will be able to access the same Data source, let's mm -hmm. say a, a text, for example, but they will be mutually, mutually excluding themselves and wait on, on one another. Yeah. So I don't know if that's what is, that's the difference. But um, uh, let me show you by just walking you through the code here. Okay. Yeah. Well, if there's any waiting, then it defeats the whole purpose of okay. it defeats the performance, okay. right? The moment you talk about introducing weight, you, okay. you know, you're gone. So see this here. So this this process here, vertex, right? I have multiple vertices here. One is transform, one is print, right? Here I've written local parallelism. Now local parallelism is I'm stopping this vertex or this stream from becoming parallel, from becoming parallel, right? Which means it's going to be a, stream, a single sequential process. Okay. If I wanted, I could have changed this attribute to introduce parallelism of this vertex. What that means, multiple threads would be creating or would be processing the logic of this vertex in parallel, okay. right? And then accumulating their results, sending their results to my next vertex, right? And you know, in a highly distributed environment, we have multiple, so this was the example that we saw, it was one jet instance doing all the processing. Right, in a highly distributed environment where you have multiple jet nodes running in, in the cluster, and you can you, you do want to change these numbers. You want to attain the highest level of parallelism, you know, based on the number of cores you have, how you know how the CPU usage like, and so on. So you have the flexibility to attain to change the parallelism of your execution, which means more parallel it is, the better TPS you're gonna get. Yep. The uh, file stream vertex, can there be more than, uh, can you use parallelism in the file stream vertex to read from one file? Yes, you can. Okay. I, I stayed away from that intentionally because that was my requirement. If I had multiple vertices reading the same data up and toward the you know, unnecessary complexity, but yes, you can. That was Tom's question around how does it know that the process of the Markers. More questions? No? Uh, uh, that was my last slide, actually. <laughs> but, but yeah, thank you very much for having me here and uh, giving me this opportunity to present. If you have further questions, please feel free to write to me directly. My email ID is rahul at hazakas.com. My Twitter handle is at wildness. Uh, and yes, if you have uh, if you have any project that you want to try, 
Here's a guest jet with. Feel free to do that. Go to jet. Uh, let's see if uh, I shut it down. Jet.hazacast.org, and that will take that will take you to Hazacast Jet. Up oh, there you go. And uh, yeah, you can download Jet. It's open source. Give it a shot. If you have any queries, any comp you know, if you have any, run into any problems, any complex complexities, just write to me. Yep. Thank you very much.